Welcome everyone to today's Connexum public webcast. We are very fortunate today to have the co-principal investigators discuss the upcoming Targeting Aging with Metformin or TAME clinical trial. Among various other titles, Nir Barzilay is Director of the Institute for Aging Research at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and Steve Kruchevsky is Director of the J. Paul Stick Center for Healthy Aging and Alzheimer's Prevention at the Wake Forest School of Medicine. Today's topic is near and dear to Kinexum's heart. First, Kinexum founder and executive chairman, Zan Fleming, while he was at the FDA, led the medical review that resulted in approval of metformin in 1995. Second, as some of you know, Kinexum is part of a metabesity movement that is trying to extend health span the amount of life spent healthy rather than debilitated by chronic diseases of aging like diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular or neurodegenerative diseases, cancers, etc., by seeking to address common underlying metabolic roots of many or most of such diseases. Emerging science in recent decades suggests that we are starting to accumulate the knowledge to realize this grand objective but social, economic, and policy factors may prove to be non-trivial obstacles to our harvesting the fruits of such scientific and medical advances. The FDA today does not know how to react if a sponsor comes in and claims to have pills that delay or cure aging. As focus shifts from therapy to delay or prevention, who will pay to conduct clinical trials that may require 100,000 patients in a decade to demonstrate efficacy and safety? And reimbursement is an uncharted frontier. Who will pay if the returns may be decades down the road and the beneficiaries may be covered by other entities that may reap the, re the benefit of the costs incurred by payers today? The TAME trial is extremely exciting because it represents a pioneering engagement with the FDA on how clinical trials that target aging may be approached. Yesterday, I was on a metabesity panel in New York City where there was some confusion about why someone would be further investigating metformin for aging, an oldie but goody generic drug that a sponsor will not make much money on. This was missing the significance of the TAME trial. Metformin is a good start, but not the end game. It represents the first generation of hopefully many more to come, but it represents the prototype for how to seek approval from the FDA and will gather valuable information on parameters that could guide the development of biomarkers that could help interrogate molecular pathways that may yield more robust drugs in the future. So a couple housekeeping points. If you're calling in, please place your phones on mute unless you're speaking after the presentation. There will be slides, so you're urged to log in so you can accept the offer to view shared slides. Ideally, you should listen in via the call-in or listen from the computer on headphones. If you're listening via speaker, there'll be an echo and feedback if your mic is live. If you have questions, please open the chat column to the right of the screen and write them out, and we will get to them in the order asked following the presentation. And finally, we will post a link on our Connexum.com website within a few days to a YouTube video of today's slides and presentation. With this, I turn the mic over to Nir and Steve. Uh, I thank Thomas for his wonderful introduction, and, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, tell, uh, give you the background and, the, and discuss the design of this very novel study to target aging uh, with the drug metformin. Um, I'm just going to start with some introductory comments before talking about the elements of designing a trial that targets aging pathways. Uh, this slide is meant to represent the current state of affairs uh, where, uh, the, and this is sort of the FDA model currently, which is we have one disease and one mechanism and uh, drugs are approved that target each uh, individual mechanism as a way of dealing with uh, treating or preventing various diseases. Uh, this ignores the fact that aging is it's a, the strongest risk factor for many, many chronic diseases. This uh, graph shows the incidence or, or the, the mortality really of, of many, many diseases that are uh, uh, afflict us. And if you look at the y-axis, you'll see this is a logarithmic scale. So 
the impact of age on disease is not linear with with time, but really logarithmic. And so, uh, for for many years, and probably until a la about the last decade, uh, people were fatalistic about aging's role in disease occurrence, not understanding that anything could, uh, or understanding that not much could be done about that. But uh, really, if you do, uh, and demographers like Jay Olshansky have done this, if you model it, we'd be much better off in controlling conditions if we could target aging, because then we don't present, prevent just one disease, uh, we prevent a whole raft of diseases that occur uh, because of biologic changes that come with age. Uh, I title this theory or this idea the geroscience hypothesis. This is uh, a, a hypothetical uh, um, uh, idea that uh, really needs to be tested uh, because it's so important. <clears throat> so we know this works on in animals. There's a big program called the Interventions Testing Program run by the NIA that takes compounds that people nominate and will do very rigorous studies to look at health span and lifespan in, in, in outbred mice. Uh, they've had many hits already of things that uh, do extend lifespan. Uh, there's been some gender or sex specific effects, so many more of the interventions work in, in male animals and females. The rapamycin is sort of the current record holder uh, which worked uh, very well in extending lifespan in both male and females. And very importantly, uh, this works even when you give it in what for a mouse's middle age. So you, you can give it later in the lifespan and still see beneficial effects from targeting the biology of aging. So it's really important to keep in mind that age is the strongest risk factor for most of our most burdensome diseases. Uh, that it's the result of a distinct biology that's increasingly being understood, and that we already know that small molecules that target that biology do extend life and health span in animal models. So how do we take this notion and put it to use for the benefit of mankind? Um, well, uh, if you're gonna try something to prevent, prevention studies have uh, require that something be safe and effective because, and safety is preeminent here because we're not necessarily doing any favors for anyone. So whatever we do should at least uh, uh, not put people at extra risk. If we look at the evaluation continuum of, of the kinds of experiments or, or tests we might do in humans, we want to quite a gamut from very uh, basic uh, research looking at changes in cellular expression and, and uh, uh, gene expression through ch changing aging physiology, uh, all the way to test whether you could expend lifespan. Uh, the problem is that uh, as you move up this continuum, uh, it's, it gets increasingly more uh, relevant to human health but also the time and expense of doing it also increases tremendously. Uh, with respect to the uh, drug uh, approval process, uh, the team from TAME, uh, trial uh, targeting aging with metformin, met with FDA uh, in a meeting organized by the American Federation for Aging Research and they were quite clear that at this stage of the game, their interest is really only st starts with the uh, prevention of age-related disease. Uh, they weren't they weren't interested in hearing much about biomarkers. They weren't uh, interested in, in mechanistic work at very at, at uh, the cellular level. But they said, well, if you could show that you can actually prevent disease, then we'd be interested in hearing more uh, about using a trial such as TAME to consider new indications uh, for, uh, that are relevant to aging research. So how would you design such a thing? And, and it's important to note that 
the most rigorous study design is a randomized clinical trial. So we're just starting from the get-go, assuming that FDA would only accept data from a randomized clinical trial, and I think that's true. And so we're trying to design such a study. We have to decide what the outcome is. Uh, we have to decide what the treatment is. Uh, you have to know how frequent the outcome is in the absence of treatment to know how many people you'll need in your study. And you also need to articulate how big an effect do you expect to find. This is also important in study planning to know how many uh, people you want in your study or how long you're going to want to follow. So if you're going to test the Gero science hypothesis, which I remember is that by targeting aging, you can prevent the emergence of multiple age-related diseases, then that's what you should plan to do. So uh, you should uh, look at multiple age-related diseases. And in, of particular interest are diseases that share few risk factors other than age. Uh, in our discussions, it could um, it often came up that, you know, maybe metformin or whatever drug you're doing uh, really targets one specific pathway, and you'll see a reduction in events in everything connected to that pathway, but that's not really aging, is it? Uh, and so this idea that you can affect multiple conditions that don't share m many risk factors is, is relevant. Uh, this collection is what we call a composite endpoint. So uh, a composite endpoint is not just uh, one disease outcome, but it's several disease outcomes that are considered together. And the outcome of interest uh, is the time until the occurrence of one of the collection occurs. So they don't all have to occur, but uh, only when the first one occurs, that's the outcome. And, and you'll hear, uh, I'll explain that in some detail in, in, in a few slides. So how would you select the diseases for this composite? Well, first is the requirement that age is its most important risk factor. It's important that there's evidence that aging biology plays a role in its occurrence. It's uh, very helpful, but not absolutely necessary that preliminary data exists supporting an effect of the proposed intervention. And also, uh, in our consultation with the FDA, they made it pretty clear that they were not interested in biochemical diagnoses such as diabetes or hyperlipidemia or, or other kinds of things that are based on physiologic measurements as opposed to clinical observations. <clears throat> so this is a, a slide taken from a paper uh, that came out of the Rochester uh, Epidemiology Project, this is from Rochester, Minnesota, where they track the age incidence in men and women of 20 different conditions. I'm not going to go all over them. I'm not going to go through each one individually, except to point out some of the starred ones. You see the very striking exponential increase with advancing age of many, many of the diseases. Uh, this particular list of diseases, which goes, uh, there are actually uh, 20 of them, are ones that represent uh, the most burden, uh, both economically and in terms of the uh, amount of uh, uh, people in the United States affected by them. So, uh, so there are many things uh, on this list uh, that uh, are age-related, but we didn't consider, like hypertension and hyperlipidemia and diabetes. Uh, several, like cancer and coronary artery, artery disease, uh, would certainly be included. So the treatment that uh, we are pursuing is metformin. Um, it is, was discovered in the 20s, and you just heard about Zan's role and its approval in the, the 1995. It's the most widely prescribed anti-diabetic in the world, and it works by uh, decreasing hepatic gluconeogenesis. Uh, we know it does a lot of other things. It's, there's a very rich biology connected to it, but this is its mode of action for uh, diabetes. So what makes uh, metformin attractive other than it having been around for a long time? Well, uh, it modulates 
critical pathways in the biology of aging. And so we can see from uh, animal models uh, that it can be used to target aging and to delay or prevent disease. <clears throat> There's evidence, which I'll touch on in a bit, that shows that it reduces the onset of many disparate diseases. Uh, it's been used safely for over 60 years. And remember, we're talking about this in a prevention context. So safety is a preeminent consideration. And it's also a generic drug, so it's really pennies a dose, which in any, um, you know, any trial of any size for any length of time, even uh, pennies at a time adds up very quickly. So the feasibility of testing it is greatly enhanced by the fact that it's available generically. So um, this is some data uh, uh, from a mouse experiment showing that uh, introducing metformin in midlife uh, increases the lifespan of mice. So uh, here, a 6% increase. But importantly, I think, for older people, because if you ask older people uh, if they want to live longer, um, a surprisingly number of them will say, no, why would I want to live any longer? I have to uh, you know, be saddled with all the, the, the negative uh, health conditions that are associated with advancing age. And so uh, very uh, uh, positively in this study, they showed a great uh, benefit for health span. And you can see here in the, the bullet list of all the, all the beneficial actions uh, of, of metformin, uh, which are larger in their effect than the uh, lifespan extension. So does metformin affect age-related diseases, even those that don't have many common risk factors? Uh, this is a summary. Uh, it certainly is strongly associated with prevention of type 2 diabetes. Uh, there's good evidence uh, that it prevents cardiovascular disease uh, and, and reduces mortality. And uh, there is observational data from observational studies, so not from clinical trials, that it prevents cancer and dementia. So this is a few studies that uh, we had reviewed for um, our application to NIH to fund our trial, uh, looking at uh, various aspects of CVD uh, and outcomes. And if you look at the effect sizes, it's showing uh, rough, uh, sort of a modal effect size of about a 20% reduction in cardiovascular disease occurrence. Uh, this is from a meta-analysis done by Gardenian a few years ago, looking at the association between metformin and cancer incidence and mortality. Uh, these are, again, are from observational data, uh, comparing people taking metformin to uh, people taking other kinds of anti-diabetic medications. So these are studies done in people with diabetes that see a substantial reduction uh, or, or, or lower, substantial lower cancer incidence and mortality in people uh, taking the metformin. Uh, this just came out. This is a new meta-analysis looking at metformin use and cognitive decline in dementia. Uh, and it shows a 45% reduction in cognitive impairment in metformin users and a 24% reduction in um, uh, uh, dementia in people using metformin. <clears throat> and this is all-cause mortality. The upper banner is from, are from observational studies showing a slight reduction uh, the UK PDS study, which uh, was uh, the f one of the f first big trials of metformin in people with early onset diabetes, showed a substantial reduction in total mortality, uh, a death from any cause, and you can see the, the hazard ratios showing um, uh, you know, about a 25% reduction in all-cause mortality. So uh, metformin is meeting a lot of our criteria for uh, to test. It's safe. 
it affects uh, bio biology pat the pathways of aging biology, and at least the data we have from humans, as far as it will take us so far, show that it affects um, uh, many uh, many age-related diseases, including things as disparate as cancer and dementia, which really show no, really have very few risk factors in common other than age. So um, taking that, we um, decided that uh, we would put the our composite endpoint would be, in, uh, and these would be things we would look in our uh, the people in our trial to see when they first occurred for these for the people in the trial, and it would be time to either a heart attack, stroke. Um, a hospitalization for congestive heart failure, uh, onset of cancer, except for prostate cancer or non-melanoma skin cancer, onset of MCI or dementia, or death. <clears throat> so as I alluded to, the design of the study is a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial, and we plan to have an open-label run-in. And the reason to do this is that a proportion of people uh, who take metformin never can, uh, can't, are not tolerant of it. They develop very severe uh, GI side effects. And so we have a, a, a dose escalation run-in so that everyone who then gets either randomized to placebo or, or the metformin are all tolerant of the drug. The dose uh, we selected was 1,500 milligrams a day in slow release, uh, uh, done once a day. It's really, it comes in 500 uh, milligram tablets, and these would be all taken together in, uh, with a meal in the morning. The median follow-up time we were planning for was 45, 45 months. And the exclusions were uh, we could not include people with diabetes uh, because we can't ethically random withhold metformin from people with diabetes, uh, impaired kidney function, uh, this is a, a, a part of the label for metformin currently, dementia, uh, because they are not people with dementia really can't consent for themselves, or severe life-threatening diseases that would, uh, uh, are so far advanced that we don't, didn't think that intervening on aging-related pathways uh, would have much uh, effect on the trajectory of their, of, of, of their pro or their prognosis. So here's the schematic of the TAME design. We're planning uh, to recruit people 65 to 80 years of old, 80 years of age. Uh, qualifications to get in is a gate speed between 0.4 and 1 meters per second. So 1 meter per second or slower uh, is, an, is a, ger a gerontologic sign that people are at greatly increased risk of developing new age-related disease. Uh, and, and people uh, are surprised when they hear that, but the data is quite compelling. So they can be eligible for the study if they're slow walkers or if they already have one age-related disease in our uh, list. Uh, they don't qualify as an endpoint if they get a recurrence of the same disease, but they would qualify as an endpoint if they got a different disease in the list. And we um, are um, estimated we would need 3,000 people to test this study, and I'll talk about the effect size in a bit. The endpoints are first the clinical endpoint, which is time to incidence. So for a person, that means they couldn't have had that condition before they got in the study. So time to incidence of any may, any of the age-related diseases that are in our, our composite. And you can see the list there in the primary outcome. And this primary outcome is speaking to the FDA. This is what they let us uh, to understand would be the one uh, the, the endpoint that would most interest them in terms of changing indication or developing a new indication for metformin. Uh, then we have functional endpoint, which is really speaking to geriatricians and the gerontologic audience, which is time to disability, which was defined as a major decline in mobility or cognitive function or the onset of ADL limitation. 
and then a tertiary outcome, which is a sort of is a biologic outcome, which is changes in biomarkers of aging and age-related diseases. There's not currently any validated biomarker or biomarker set that could be used, <clears throat> and even if it existed, FDA wouldn't consider it uh, as part of a of a, a process to. Uh, to, uh, for a new indication for a drug or, or an indication for any age-related disease at this point because there's just not enough information. So the uh, estimation using three, uh, uh, two different data sets, uh, a, a LIFE trial which had people who were at high risk of disability and another community dwelling, uh, uh, another data set called the Health ABC, if we apply our entry criteria to this study, we can see over the planned duration of the study, which is five years, that, uh, so for example, in the LIFE study, there's a 10.9% annual incidence of a new onset morbidity that we would consider. And so over five years, the accumulation of that is uh, close to 38%. Uh, a healthier community dwelling population gives us a cumulative incidence of 35% over the course of the study, um, it's known, well known that uh, no matter what data you use to model your study, uh, the event rate's always lower when you actually do it. So we decided to be conservative and plan for a, an annual event rate of 7.5%, which gets us about a 27% incidence in the placebo group after, after, uh, over the course of the study. And we planned on deflecting that by about 20%. So we have about 80% power, 84% power to uh, uh, to observe a 20% reduction in that cumulative incidence. So that takes us from about 27% in the placebo group to about um, uh, uh, 23, 22% in the intervention group. So to summarize, uh, TAME is feasible, uh, a 3,000 person, five-year five, uh, five study is no longer or larger than many other trials, and it's smaller than many of them. Uh, there's no single correct endpoint. Uh, different endpoints speak to different audiences, but you need to do a big long-term study first to link all the all the endpoints at the various levels together. So uh, while <clears throat> the need for clinical endpoints is sort of clear cut from the FDA perspective, uh, the data that we plan to collect, including a, a very a fairly aggressive and uh, repository process, would allow people to develop uh, biomarkers that might be used in future research to develop uh, even better drugs. So uh, thank you for listening, and I'd like to acknowledge the uh, executive committee of TAME, starting with Nir, who sort of has been spearheading this whole thing. Uh, and then uh, you can see Vanita Roda, Mark Esplin, Jamie Justice, and George Kukul. And with that, I'm going to ask Nir to say a few comments. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for me, it's a special pleasure to, as a as a biologist more to come and interact with Steve and collaborate on something that we really feel will will change things significantly. And I also do appreciate uh, Zen and and Thomas leadership and helping uh, both in ways like that and also with the FDA um, uh, to move things forward. I want to make. Um, five short uh, comments. Uh, the first is that we know that our life, uh, maximal lifespan potential as a species, as humans, is about 115 years. By the way, we would argue about the number, but 115 years. And now we die on average before the age of 80. Um, so there are 35 years that are out there that we haven't used effectively. We have the capability and we have to use that. And, and metformin 
is going to be the weakest drug. There will be other drugs, other mechanism, combination of drugs, and we can make a progress in expanding uh, our health span uh, because we have the capacity uh, to do it as far as lifespan is concerned. Um, we actually cannot not do it. You know, we are stuck now. We are just accumulating diseases and their treatments. And it makes no sense for us not to target aging, in particular because there is a clear longevity dividend for living healthier longer. It was calculated by Joel Shansky. Uh, you can look at the reference, but uh, there will be a $7 trillion save in the next 40 years if we extend lifespan with drugs like metformin, health span, by two to three years. We cannot afford not to do that. The third comment is that um, we're talking about aging. We're talking about people who are growing older. Of course, there's a discrepancy between the biological aging and the chronological aging. But we have to remember that there are a group of people that are aging more rapidly. For example, those who have HIV, they're estimated to be 10 years older than their age when you look at outcomes like we're looking. The same stands for people who are surviving cancer, uh, either the cancer, the therapy, the radiation, the chemotherapy. So the need to find uh, drugs that uh, affect aging is much more extensive than just the old people. I also would say that if we are uh, going to go to Mars, um, if we are not going to protect components of aging, we would get, you know, cancer by the time we arrive at Mars. Uh, so we'll need to uh, um, talk about aging and how to um, target it, how to delay it, how to stop it and maybe reverse it if we want to expand our uh, human experience as well. I want to end by uh, the challenges. The challenge is that you know, if there's no indication of the FDA to target aging, the healthcare providers are not going to pay uh, for a drug. If the healthcare providers are not going to pay for the drug, of course, the pharmaceuticals are not going to develop drug, not because they don't want to, because but because there's no business plan. And so one of the things that we have to do, and for me, the only reason that I really uh, wanted to uh, do TAME is by the end of it to have an indication at the FDA, and that what would lead to the real revolution in aging. There's a lot of biotechs out there, lots of interesting intellectual properties that have targeted aging effectively. If we don't have this indication, the pharmaceuticals are not going to get those properties and develop it, develop that into drugs. Uh, this is a big challenge, and this is also where um, uh, Zan and Thomas are, are coming in. But we are sure that there's no way not to start targeting aging, and that this is only a beginning that will uh, allow us, you know, hopefully at the next decade to spend 80 years to achieve a biological age of 60. And this will be fantastic. So thank you for this effort, and I'll stop now. Steve and Nir, thank you so much for the presentation. We will uh, start going down the list of questions on the in the chat box column on the right. Dean had a question. Has Dr. Krzyzewski put himself on metformin? Steve. Uh, I have not. Um, I'm interested in doing that. My my uh, uh, biochemical indices are changing in an expected age-related way, and so I'm looking forward to having a uh, conversation with my internist about that. You, you know, the, the real answer from our perspective is that until we do the study, until there's clinical study, it's all a hope or a promise, but it hasn't been proven. So we're not uh, calling for people to be on metformin. I was actually uh, giving a talk to lay people in Quebec, in Montreal this week, 
there are 300 people in the audience and on the way in, some of them asked me about those of metformin. And so in the beginning of the lecture, I said, can I ask who here in the audience, by the way, older people, but obviously interested, how many of you don't have diabetes, but are taking metformin? And half of the people raised their hands. I know that some of the metformin sales increased by 50% in some of the generic companies, which is another reason to do TAME now, because uh, is it safe? Maybe it's the opposite. Uh, we have to do the clinical studies and we have to do it now so that people will have the answer. Thank you. Todd's question is, in the past, I understood Zan to say he has not been a fan of early metformin. Has he changed his mind, Zan? Um, I actually have been wanting to be on metformin for quite a while. It's been sloth and um, uh, just plain old uh, pr uh, prastic, uh, uh, um, um, what's the word, <laughs> that has kept me from getting on it. So I, I'm, I'm all for it. I hope to get on it soon. Can, can I can okay. I just add also that a friend of early metformin, you know, our study is looking at people 65 to 80 because this is the population that will have our outcomes. Even if it's a good result, it doesn't tell us at that point in which age you should start taking metformin. This will have to be realized maybe later and by uh, additional studies. David asked a question, chronic pain is a common affliction of the elderly. Arthritis as identified as one reason, but there are many others. I'm puzzled and would like to know whether or not metformin has any positive effect in treating chronic pain. So this is Steve. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any such evidence, but that would certainly be one of the endpoints that we would collect. Uh, this is a tremendous opportunity to look at uh, pleiotropic effects of metformin across the many domains of things that affect aging, and we're hoping to collect uh, uh, really dispositive data on most of them. Uh, Charlie had a question. What is the distance required at the 0.4 to 1.0 meters per second rate? Uh, this is usually over six meters. David asked, uh, where is FDA in their thinking with regard to approving such age-related indications? We were talking the, with the FDA about the design of the study and the endpoints. The FDA can act when we actually have a result, but at least we know that we're doing with the right with the right kind of study. The discussion, by the way, with the FDA, we never discussed metformin. It's on their web. You know, we are really repurposing a drug, so we we didn't have to talk about the drug, but we had to talk about this idea that that at the end we have a composite of disease that is like saying it's aging. Not, none of us wanted to have an indication for aging because not everybody that age is sick. Uh, you don't have to, you, wanna, you don't wanna be all of a sudden in a group when you cross, I don't know, 65. And of course there's ageism. So uh, we, we, we agreed that a composite um, of age-related disease, if we make an impact on a composite, it's like saying aging, and it's really what's going to be relevant for further uh, drug development. Uh, Ron Howard made a wonderful film. If you're interested in aging, the best film ever done on aging through National Geographic uh, is called The Age of Aging. You can uh, load it down with or without a $2.5 uh, fee. And uh, you can see an interview with Bob Temple at the FDA who basically says, if they can do that, bring it on. Uh, uh, they, they certainly have been educated and they're certainly waiting for us to show them that we can do that. Right. And I just want to affirm that, Nir. I think that, just as you say, if pain is positive, it will be taken very seriously by FDA. And 
in that sense, it is blazing the trail, but this is how it has to be done. You have to have robust data to support a reasonable indication. And there's nothing that is far-fetched about this indication. As it reads, uh, age-related um, complications of aging, I think that's a perfectly good indication. So I, I think, in short, FDA can approve metformin or any other product if it can show a positive result in just the kind of design that Steve and Mir put together. Art has asked, what is or are potential mechanisms of anti-aging action of metformin other than reducing glucose and modest weight loss? Uh, so I will, uh, I will take this question. And first of all, I would offer, I'll, I'll pass to you, uh, Thomas, a, a paper that we wrote together that was published in Cell Metabolism uh, not too long ago that has a lot of the actions of metformin. And okay. uh, in a very simplistic way, I'll, I'll, I'll make three points because because metformin is uh, in the midst of aging, it's not something that we can do without slicing in a reasonable amount of time. But th these are the major point. Metformin uh, gets through a transporter and binds to complex one of the mitochondria. And by doing that, and by the way, what I'm telling you is that metformin is a, like a weak cyanide, okay? So there are two things that happen. On one hand, there's a whole metabolic adaptation in energetics that uh, increased AMP kinase, which decreased mTOR. And I said two important things that are in the biology of aging, to increase AMP kinase and to decrease mTOR. That's what rapamycin is doing. And as Steve showed, rapamycin has a robust effect even late in life um, in, in, in targeting aging. So on one hand, it's those metabolic pathways. On the other hand, by decreasing mitochondria um, energetic, there is a decrease in uh, ROS production and also decrease in inflammation. There is evidence that metformin corrects all the nine pillars of the biology of aging. And I think that's the, uh, so I, I said one point metabolic, one point uh, energetic and, and inflammatory. But, but the most important point, I think, and that's what happens uh, when we give any of those drugs that target aging, because they fix aging on the cellular level, a lot of things are corrected. And so the confusing thing is that you see the metformin has, the, is doing 30 different things. And groups have showed and repeated some of those observations. And it's not because metformin is necessarily doing it directly, but it's because metformin is fixing the aging and you can then achieve youthfulness. And by then you corrected many other things. Terrific. Uh, Steve asks, the FDA might be interested in using for pre-diabetes to prevent diabetes there are 90 to 100 million with prediabetes and will grow to probably a trillion dollar expense. The FDA and the AMA should be interested. I guess it's not so much a question, but any comment or reaction to Steve's comment? This is Gordon. Um, <clears throat> several years ago in the, uh, the American Diabetes Association, if I'm remembering it correctly, did um, in the absence of, uh, well, as a result of trials, but in the absence of, of FDA, still uh, advocated um, the uh, treatment of prediabetes with metformin. Uh, they thought it was uh, their, their sort of, in their annual um, summary of all the different topics in diabetes and, and what should be done. So there, there certainly is expert opinion that thinks it's a reasonable thing to do. And I, I actually ended up starting, uh, I'd had prediabetes for a number of years and um, partly because uh, I have this sense that glucose really is a toxin. I think I first got this when I saw that the Framingham study showed that 
people with an A1C of five had 18% lower uh, mortality than those who had a, an A1C of six, which is the upper limit of normal. So it, it doesn't seem like that there's a safe level of glucose even in, in uh, healthy uh, levels. Uh, so anyway, I've been, I've been taking it. I, I have no idea as an uncontrolled experiment whether it's doing, uh, has a net benefit or not. Right. Uh, Zen, where, weren't you with the uh, uh, diabetes people at the FDA to uh, try and get uh, pre-diabetes approved? Uh, I know that diabetologists went to the FDA to have an indication of pre-diabetes. It's ab about the same time that we went to the FDA with the aging uh, story. And, and just as much as the FDA said drop diabetes because it's a biochemical, uh, you know, it's a biochemical diagnosis and uh, the people with diabetes will 40% of it will get complication 10 years later. So we, we want outcomes. Um, and uh, it's pretty much what they said to the diabetes uh, group. They said, well, if prediabetes is, is important, then just make diabetes the diagnosis of hemoglobin A1C that's lower and will be included. They really didn't want to, want to do it. And it's interesting that although there is clear evidence of the benefit of metformin for prediabetics, only 3% of the United States prediabetic population are on metformin. Uh, I just wanted to, to affirm what Gordon said. And, and to this day, ADA puts metformin in the practice guidance for prediabetes. So it is... Um, awaiting FDA's agreement to ultimately grant that indication. There, is, there are several efforts aimed at getting such an indication right now, and I, I think FDA will come around to it. It, it is something they've been resistant to, but, but I do think that it's, it's in the cards. You know, this is uh, Gordon again, and, and, you know, part of this might be terminology, and, and perhaps the diabetologist could learn something from the hypertension field. For years, uh, there was this term of prehypertension, and uh, I can recall, uh, again, many years ago, I began to, uh, I asked my physician to prescribe uh, uh, antihypertensives because I had reached uh, 135 over 87 and it had steadily gone up over the years and I knew I had a family history and, and uh, of hypertension. Uh, but at that point that was pre-hypertension and it, um, none of the guidelines recommended treating at that point um, and so forth. Um, since then, studies have clearly shown that, uh, that targeting uh, blood pressure levels down to 120 over 80 um, compared to 140 over 90, which had been uh, uh, the norm, uh, had advantages on uh, all of these important uh, major clinical endpoints, stroke, heart attack, so forth. And, uh, and because of that, um, the hypertensive people really uh, redefined all of these things and got rid of, they got rid of prehypertension. Anyone with a blood pressure over 120 over 80 has hypertension. 120 over 80 is st actually is stage one hypertension, anything above 119. So that although they don't advocate treating um, above 120 over 80 uh, initially with drugs, they recommend lifestyle and exercise and weight control and so forth. Um, the, 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 uh, the whole approach semantically is to make clear that all of these are abnormal and are risks for later serious problems. And maybe pre-diabetes makes it sound like you don't have a problem yet. Okay. Dr. Hazard asks, has the FDA agreed to act as if, uh, if it works, as hypothesized, and applied to new drugs under development? I think we touched on that a little bit, but Steve Arnier or Zan, uh, I guess FDA doesn't commit necessarily. They want to see what the data say, but... Uh, uh, what's the what's your best response to this question? Well, I I think we said I I just wanted to uh, thank Dr. Hazard for his contribution to our field. Um, he he kind of started all that, but um, I I don't I don't have re I think we touched about it. Unless Steve, you want to say something? No, I have nothing to add. 
Zan, I think what Zan said about this before is that uh, the FDA is engaging. The, the the group has talked to them, and these endpoints have been uh, formulated uh, with FDA. And so obviously it depends on the data, but uh, if uh, we can hit those endpoints, obviously they're they're willing to consider a, I suppose, a label for metformin, and uh, therefore next generation drugs would be able to follow the pathway. Uh, Paul asks, uh, uh, says endpoints that may vary over time, for example, unstable angina may add statistically troublesome noise to composite endpoints. In this context, can you elaborate on the inclusion of dementia in the endpoints, specifically how the noise contribution can be limited? Well, uh, dementia as a diagnosis uh, depends on uh, several convergent factors all being true at the same time, and it doesn't vary very much through time. Uh, mild cognitive impairment is, is a little bit like that, a uh, little less uh, stable, and so it's not quite as reliable an endpoint. But our feeling is uh, it's been used in many studies. Uh, the way we're proposing on ascertaining it is very much in line with other large trials and, and uh, it may add a little noise, but I think that noise is also uh, considered in our sample size calculations. Steve asks, using metformin in a study for pre-diabetics to prevent diabetes would be a great place to start. Sorry, I guess this is a comment to the discussion. Cliff uh, notes that there's a need for vitamin B12 to combine at, at possible neurop symptoms. Uh, any thoughts on combining vitamins or other agents? I guess this is a little bit of a biohack because it's not being studied formally by TAME, but there are people who are out there trying various combinations, and there are companies like Michael Zemel, I think, is on from NuCert, who's looking at combinations of drugs that can help uh, to uh, get even more robust results, and I think everyone is looking at the TAME trial very carefully as a practice. Well, well uh, uh, actually, first of all, Cliff Bailey, hi Cliff Bailey, he's one of the most knowledgeable people in metformin with huge experience, and he's asking about vitamin B12 because vitamin B12 is actually decreased in um, many patients on uh, metformin. And we have been looking at it uh, very closely, and there is a literature about that. And the, I think the interesting thing is that there's a, a time course for the decline of vitamin B12. Steve, I'm, I'm, I'm all of a sudden blocking. I think we're measuring first time in year two, um, but, but we are, uh, we're not doing combination, but we are measuring. That, that's right. I don't remember exact. I think year two is, I think you're right on that, but I have to go look at the document to be sure. Uh, Charlie helpfully put up the citation for the cell metabolism article that uh, Neil Neer, uh, referred to, metformin is a tool to target uh, aging. Uh, he then comments, low levels of A1C are associated with worse outcomes, just like high levels. As he recalls, best A1C is around 7%. Uh, Charlie, do you want to Elaborate on that, or and any other response? Any responses? Well, there's um, a, 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 as as far as I know, there's no U shape for hemoglobin A1C. Um, but from a diabetes perspective, you started achieving less decline in, in concentration the more closer you get to below seven, and and seven is the cut is is what we try to achieve by diabetes treatment. Actually, there, there have been studies that have showed that there is a U-shaped relationship between outcomes and A1C. Now, that may be because if somebody has cancer, they don't eat and they, you know, get very low levels of glucose. And it may be because if people are sick, they also don't have normal hepatic gluconeogenesis, and that also reduces blood glucose levels. You know, there's obviously you can hypothesize a lot of reasons for a U-shaped curve, but I, but I believe there that it's fairly clear that there is a U-shaped curve with regard so are, to A1C. Are, are you are you talking about U-shaped curves in diabetics? In 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 both, actually, I think you can you can find a U-shaped curve in both diabetic and non-diabetic. I'm not aware. In diabetics, there's uh, I saw somebody who showed U-shaped curve because hypoglycemia. Is um, 
is a risk for death and you get it if people with diabetes get ridiculously low hemoglobin A1c, it's because they spend a lot of time hypoglycemic and it's usually not metformin alone, but in combination with insulin. Uh, for non-diabetic, I'm not aware. I would love to, I'll search for it, definitely. Art uh, comments that his guess is FDA would allow a biochemical diagnosis of prediabetes, but the FDA should want a clinical endpoint in patients with that diagnosis. I don't know if there are further comments on that. This is Bill Hazard. We've got just got about a, a minute left uh, on our screen here. And my, uh, my comment is a general one, and that is all of this discussion about how this study should could be improved, I think, is beside the point here. Uh, this has been extremely well designed, and it is a very conservative approach to an extremely important question. I wanted to, co to comment also on a discussion we had at the National Academy of Medicine last week, uh, and it had to, and the, the focus of the of the meeting was cancer and its treatment. What what cancer introduces is lots of possibilities for treat, treating, but the, the, the fact is that no one can expect, afford them because uh, all the drugs that would be developed and are being developed are unaffordable once you apply them to the population at risk. Therefore, I would hope we would not, we would really abide by the strict rules of a Random allocation, double blind uh, uh, study that we've we've heard described here, and not uh, pose a, what would happen if something came out and so forth, because we we could unleash a, a lot of premature development of drugs that we could never afford to interfere with the process. We have a drug we can afford. Let's do it right. Great comment, dear. Any response or? No, thank you, Bill. Thank you. I agree. Todd asks, has there been any consideration of specifying cognitive function as an exploratory endpoint? There's certainly many ways to measure early decline. I thought uh, MCI was one of the... Uh, yes, the basket, uh, absolutely. MCI is, uh, is an endpoint, and I should say that there are two um, small clinical studies looking at metformin in patients with MCI with... Uh, some positive uh, results in certain domains, uh, but absolutely, MCI and Alzheimer's are endpoints. And Cliff mentioned, uh, yes, it's combat neuropathy. MCI is mild cognitive impairment. Yes. Perhaps it's, it being a few minutes afternoon. Thank you so much, and uh, we, you know, have a great weekend.